Hello and welcome to Making Capitalism Sustainable on True Chat, broadcasting from the Committee for Economic Development in Washington, D.C. I'm your host, Steve Odlin, the CEO of the Committee for Economic Development. And we're very pleased to have a special guest today, Barbara Barrett. Barbara is going to be discussing a whole host of topics from aerospace to education policy to trade policy because Barbara can do it. She has literally done all these things. She's got so many titles. She's got so many experiences and we're just so fortunate to have her with us. Among her many titles is that she is the chairman of the Aerospace Corporation um, and she's a former United States ambassador to Finland, a former advisor to five United States presidents on defense and trade policy, former president of University Business School, and she's also an instrument-rated pilot. And following astronaut training, she became certified for spaceflight. Barbara, we are so proud to count you as a CED member, and welcome to the show today. Thanks so very much. I'm proud to be a member of the CED family, and I find great value from my membership. Well, thank you. And, you know, we, we have to start by congratulating you on your recent recognition from CED, and you received the Leadership in the Nation's Interest Award here in Washington at a at a major dinner, and uh, we are we were just so pleased to provide that for you, and congratulations again on that uh, that great award. Thank you very much. I'm conscious of what a great privilege it is to have received that award, and I uh, stunned at how many people in. I recently was in Portugal, and and then at the Paris Air Show, and in both places, people came up to me and said they had been at the dinner and uh, congratulated me on the award. So thank you very much. Isn't that incredible that you know the, the world is a small place, and uh, and you, you've touched so many corners of it. You know, let's start by talking about your passion for aerospace, which I know is. Is more than a hobby. It's it it really is a career and it's a and it's a passion. How did you get started uh, in the aerospace field? Well, aerospace is so important right now. Uh, I got started to really. I worked in the state legislature and was an intern and had responsibility for writing the bill to create the Department of Transportation for the state of Arizona. And transportation was my topic of expertise. That morphed into aviation and aviation morphed into aviation and aerospace. So it was a natural progression that derived from the transportation field. Well, and, and you know, you're a, you're a pilot uh, and, and you've flown uh, fighter jets, which is uh, very unusual for any American, but, but you've done it all. You might want to talk about that. Well, I've flown, I've flown in fighter jets uh, with qualified fighter jet pilots. I am not a fighter jet pilot myself, but I but I have had a number of occasions where I had the chance to fly in them and and to fly them. And so uh, I have the highest respect for those people that are fighter pilots who themselves defend America and are courageous enough to put their lives on the line for all of us. But what they do is really spectacular. And the risks they take and the uh, work they do on a day-to-day basis. I am very impressed with what our American fighter pilots are doing. And you've done a carrier landing, haven't you? I was in the aircraft for a carrier landing. I was with an instructor pilot who who managed the, that uh, process. But yeah, uh, four full trap landings on a carrier, one touch and go and one wave off foul deck on the Nimitz. I've never done it, but I've heard people talk about it. And uh, you know, you've got the the ship going up and down, obviously rising and falling with the waves, and you've got to hit uh, the short landing. What what was the experience like? That was absolutely an e-ticket. It uh, I had calm seas and and steady winds, and it was daytime. And I know that these young men and women are doing those carrier landings in high seas, in variable winds, and uh, even at night. I have the greatest respect for what they do. Yeah, and and, and then you know you took that experience and and you became an astronaut, which is uh, it, it's a fascinating story. I, I've heard it before, but but share with us that, uh, you, you know, briefly how you came about to uh, to be accepted into that program and, and your experience with that. Well, once again, uh, I, I look up to those who do it as a profession. I was trained as an individual for uh, as the backup to one of the space tourists who had signed up through the Space Adventures program. And so I was the, his backup and had to go through all of the training. As the backup, you have to qualify just until the day of the launch. You really are not certain who's going to go. So I uh, went through all the training. Of course, they spend the first two weeks just 
making sure that you're medical, that you're not going to be disqualified because of a medical condition. I had been on the board of Mayo Clinic at that point, so I thought I got pretty good medical reviews, but it wasn't good enough for the Russians. This was all through the Soyuz program, as you know. We don't have a way to get to our International Space Station since the retirement of the uh, space shuttle. So my training was through the Soyuz, first of medical um, analysis to make sure I was medically capable, and that was two weeks of eight hours a day medical tests, and then classroom tests, and then practical tests uh, in the mock-up equipment of the Soyuz and the International Space Station. It was a phenomenal experience. And and just, you know, you, Barbara, you're just so modest, but... It, it, you have to share. So this was this was uh, done with through the Russian program, and so the first thing you had to do was learn to speak Russian. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was part of it. Yeah, the the classes were all in Russian. We had an interpreter uh, for the classroom work, but in preparation for the launch of the launch, because it is by the Russians, we expected the Russians to learn English when they were launching on our shuttle. So now that we can only get to our space station uh, segment by Russian Soyuz, the Russians expect us to learn Russian language. So uh, the, the classes were all in Russian through an interpreter, but we were expected to learn Russian because, of course, they, the, the checklist the spaceship itself, all the controls are in Russian or worse, Russian acronyms. So the checklists are in Russian. The acronyms on the on the controls are all Russian Cyrillic alphabet and uh, and based on Russian language words. So yes, it was. There were some challenges to it. It was a, in a four and a half month period. It was a challenge to figure out how to put all of that together and manage the real lessons of uh, preparation for space. What, what an incredible experience. Now, space, space is something, you know, everybody grew up watching the, uh, you know, the early uh, astronauts. And, uh, but I think you know, nobody's, no, no normal human being has been there. So, but, but space is, it goes beyond just that thing that's that area up there. It is an incredibly important concept and, uh, and part of the uh, of the global economy, and uh, you're very articulate on on the importance of this. You might want to share some thoughts on that. Ah, Steve, that, it's a personal passion of mine. For when we are right now in the federal government, spending a lot of time talking about investing in our infrastructure. When we think of infrastructure today, all too often we think about those 1940s vintage infrastructural items, the roads, the bridges, the potholes. But if you think about what is the infrastructure of our time and of the future, it is error not to think about space. A majority of what we do is involved space. Our navigation, our communication, our imagery, our just everything we do, the capability to have power to our homes, the water systems are based on space. Our, you can't pump gas without using space assets generally. Our banking is all based on space. When we think about our infrastructure, it isn't just bridges and roads. Those are important, but of vital importance to commerce, to industry, and to everyday lives is uh, the asset that we have called space capability. Yeah, and that includes everything, you know, GPS system, communication system, and that that affects commerce. It affects defense, and and it, it. I just don't think people, you know, until you you started talking through it with me the other day, I had I just hadn't connected how how reliant we are on this, uh, you know, on on this area that we never go to, you know. Well, it's ubiquitous, but it's also invisible. So. A, a Washingtonian once quipped, why are we spending all the money on all those satellites? I can get all that information right off of my computer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sadly, yeah. people don't, yeah, exactly. get it, don't understand how very dependent we are because it is not visible to us. But yeah. what if we took it away, almost everything we do in a day would not be happening, including things like this podcast. Yeah, and it's really important that, that we work together with other nations to uh, to agree on how to govern it, to, to keep it free of trash, and that's a big issue as, as well. So all of this needs to be coordinated, doesn't it? 
It does, and space debris is a huge issue of risk to our assets there and to our people in space. Uh, so space debris is a huge issue, and minimizing it is something we can do. But there are new inventions coming out on how to capture space debris. In just one, in just one instance, uh, the, the Chinese at- attacking a space asset uh, created debris that at first is a is a consolidated debris field, but over time it scatters throughout a vast portion of our space where we have active satellite uh, satellites in use. So it's it's vulnerable, it, but it is uh, essential to our daily lives. Well, that's it's incredible. Well, let, let's turn now to to your uh, career in government. You've served in many many positions, but one of them was as a member of President Reagan's advisory committee on trade negotiations. And I think, you know, in this era where, you know, you've got uh, certain members of both parties, you know, bashing trade and and I think out there with misinformation on trade, um, you know, it's important that people understand that it's not a zero sum game and and uh, it is the creator of wealth and jobs and all of that. Talk about your experience with trade and your your views. Trade is what enriches all of our lives. So we have to be more productive. We have to produce more than we consume in order to have resources to spend. Once we spend, once we have some resources to spend uh, to enrich our lives, it is optimal to have the people who are able to produce the most efficiently. Uh, be doing the production so that we can so that each can specialize in the thing at which they are the best. Um, international trade allows us to do that, and everyone wins um, in the long run. But in the short term, it does require retraining, and there are short term hazards that we need to figure out how we mitigate that. And in some cases, you know, we need to have boutique capabilities that uh, that we may buy our, uh, much of our steel from abroad, but there will be specialty steels that we really want to have made locally, or there are national defense elements that we want to make sure we are making here. We need to maintain a manufacturing capability in the United States, but trade is a way of our selecting and spec- and being very specific about what we invest our time and our resources in on site. Trade enriches everyone. Transitioning can have its disruptive forces, and we need to be attentive to those. Yeah, you know, and I think people don't realize that how uh, globally integrated supply chains have become, and just in the businesses I ran, uh, you know, you, you'd like to buy locally, but there wasn't supply of any that thing that we sold locally. And so therefore it needed to be, it needed to come from other places. And, um, it, but you know, that's okay. I mean, you've got goods, components being manufactured in one com- country, shipping across borders, being assembled elsewhere, shipping back across bo- borders. So, you know, we really have to be careful to understand how uh, all of this happens and how wealth is created and how trade has lifted billions of people out of poverty and, and you know, enforce it, you know, and put uh, trade adjustment in when, when people are displaced, as you said. But, but really, you know, we've got to be careful because, you know, public sentiment has shifted, hasn't it? I had a senior um, family friend who once said, Miss Barbara, did you ever see something that you thought you wanted and when you, when you got what you wanted, you found out it isn't what you wanted at all? And I think opposition to trade can fall into that category. It might sound really good to to be independent, self-dependent. And self-sufficiency, you know, we, we want to we want to have second sources. We want to make sure we're not dependent upon a monopoly. But the international trade is a way of having multiple sources and of having a selection of things and of avoiding monopoly dependence upon a sole source. And uh, that's we want to avoid. We want to be careful to not be captive of any one provider. But international trade is often the way that we can do that. You know, you've been involved shifting again to uh, you've been involved in education and uh, uh, you and your husband, Craig, have supported the Barrett Honors College at the. Arizona State University. You were the interim president at Thunderbird, um, the Global Management School. Talk about uh, your views of our uh, higher education system today. What are 
what are we doing well and what are some of our biggest opportunities? Topic of some passion, I think, and it is a topic of passion to many. Education is what dictates what our future is going to be. So we have great performers at, at the high end, but we have too many people that are left behind in our education system. And that is a tyranny of the worst sort. So in higher education, one of the biggest problems we face is the incoming um, product, the, in, the uh, production of our K-12 system, which needs to be upgraded dramatically. And we need to incorporate new learning capabilities and styles, but, but then we also need to in, Force or make sure there is relevance of what the uh, subject matters are, and and bring in new topics and and um, have unity among or bring topics together that are mixtures of what had been the topics that we discussed of old. Modernizing our topic areas and modernizing our delivery systems. There's a value to having. Students get together, uh, the, the social impact that you get from a university education is great, but our method of delivery is no longer limited to a professor in front of a classroom. The professors are still key, but there are other methods of delivery that can afford a great education. Yeah, no, you know, and what's interesting to me is that, uh, you know, the private sector is the primary consumer of the output of our uh, post-secondary education system, and yet business leaders are not really engaged in this subject matter. And I, you know, we, we found at CED that, uh, that we need to bring uh, leaders of uh, post-secondary institutions, colleges, universities, for-profit, not-for-profit, but bring them together with our business leaders so that, you know, the production of the skills uh, and the development of skills from the education perspective matches the needs. And, you know, that mismatch is uh, is quite problematic, especially when, with these massive amounts of student debt that we have. Well, Steve, I think that our business leaders are providing some of the greatest leadership in modernizing our education delivery system. They are the recipients of this product, and they know what the deficiencies are and what needs to be done. And there's a passion among business leaders, and many of them are the ones who are leading the way in new delivery systems, in charter schools, in brightening up, in working with public schools. It can't happen enough. And, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm glad to hear that, uh, that that we're seeing some some involvement. And uh, some of the feedback I got is that your list of accomplishments, and I know this embarrasses you a little bit, but your list of accomplishments is longer than, than you know, the most successful people, 10 of them, you know, combined. How do you find time to chair all these organizations, you know, do your, your private business, but also give back uh, in, in charitable organizations and public policy organizations. How do you, how do you do it? I do just what you do, Steve. I like what I do <laughs> and I do it with vigor and enthusiasm. And I, uh, I think that the key to everything is to enjoy what you do. For much of my life, I did what I had to do. Today, I do what I enjoy doing and what I think produces an outcome, and that brings me great joy and that allows me to um, apply to get more done in a shorter time. Well, and and you know, you, you you said before, if it gets on the calendar, it gets done. And and uh, but but you do it with such grace and and aplomb. I, Barbara Barrett, we're, we're so happy to have uh, had the time to talk to you today, and uh, uh, and it's been a pleasure. That's our show today, and I want to thank Barbara again for spending time with us as our guest. To learn more about the Committee for Economic Development and to get involved, be sure that you check out our website at ced.org. We're also on Twitter and Facebook under the name CED Update. And if you haven't already, make sure that you download True Chat's mobile app. You can connect with us on social media right in the app, or visit our website, truechat.org. That's T-R-U-E-C-H-A-T dot org. Make sure that you check out all the other shows on True Chat as well, from sports and politics to pop culture, entertainment, business, lifestyle, local, and more. There's something for everyone on True Chat. For the Committee for Economic Development, I'm True Chat. I'm Steve Odlin. Thanks for listening to Making Capitalism Sustainable. 